Hello, this is Joan with the Joan Yurkovich Show on 910 KINA, Saturday mornings at 9 a.m. We're here with a young entrepreneur, and I have identified several young entrepreneurs here in the Salina area that I'm going to want to talk to over the course of a few shows. And I also want you to stay, stay tuned in because after we finish with this young entrepreneur, you're going to hear from a second one who's in a very different type of business because our second entrepreneur coming on is a young tattoo artist and also uh, works in a shop with body piercing. So let's go from all of that to our actual guest, William Justice, who is the owner of the Wood Fashion Cafe. So we're going from body piercing to food. Is that a little odd? <laughs> I don't think so. Okay. I think we're kind of bringing something similar to the community, something uh, a little edgier, because you know we're not just, just doing any old food. Uh, right, We're doing right. something that uh, you don't usually, in fact, can't find anywhere in Salina, uh, and is normally associated with more urban, you know, uh, some would say sophisticated places, you know, like Kansas City or Lawrence or, you know. Well, and I can certainly system. agree with all of that because I've been to your cafe. So what, what is your hallmark? What do you like to present there and tell for the people who've never been there? Well, we, we you know, we do a number of things. Uh, and the most important, the thing that's most, that I feel most passionate about uh, is that we use as much food from local farmers and ranchers as we possibly can. Um, all of our meat uh, is from local ranchers um, and as much produce as we can afford to buy and also that we find in season is there. Now, because we do that, it changes the way we do business. You know, um, we can't do wings, for instance. Oh, um, you can't do like hot chicken wings? No, because there, there's well, a lot don't. of things that you, you're not able to do because <laughs> yeah. they're a product of this large, yes. cheap industrial food system, you right. know, that processes millions of chickens and cuts up all the wings and you get the wings in a bag. Mm -hmm. Well, we get the whole chicken. Mm -hmm. You know, and so in order to do a, you know a, a thing of a dozen wings, we'd have to go through six chickens, and then what do we do with the rest? Right. Uh, sort right. of similar with uh, like lunch meat. You know, you wouldn't think of it, but that's a, a product of a you know nationwide a large processing plant, a huge processing plant, right. and and a lot of times they're pressing together meat from multiple animals and which is scary uh, it can be a little scary i want to you know <laughs> you never know I, it's I, like the mystery hot dogs like, we don't know what we're going to eat yeah, eating yeah next. i eat some of those things too you know so i'm not you know going to like fear monger yeah. or anything but yeah. um but by uh, but by supporting so you local are farms. serving mystery hot dogs down there. We're not. We're serving no, uh, all so. pork hot dogs. Yeah, I, actually. I've seen those. Yeah. Those actually look pretty good. Oh, they're delicious. So, yeah. Yeah. So so, but I also want to focus on you know besides just what you're doing there at your restaurant. You know, you're you're young. Can I ask how old you are? I can because you're a guy, right? Um, I, I could be, I could take offense just because <laughs> I'm a guy. I admit I'm care. sexist. I'm totally sexist. How old are you? Come on, I'm spit 31. it out. Okay. I'm 31. <laughs> because I was looking for people, like I kind of said, young, you know, and, and I'm certainly older than you. And you cannot ask me my age, by the way. But I was kind of categorizing as 35 years old and younger. So is this your first business venture? Yes, absolutely. It is. Okay. How did you how did you get started? How did you decide to go out and uh, do this on your own? It, it you know, it's a big venture. Well, it was I kind of stumbled into it. I don't know. It, I was living out in uh, San Francisco until a year ago, uh, well, Berkeley actually, uh, and had lived out there for a while and been cooking for a while and even done had done some catering just for um, you know like a book launch party or uh, an art show. You know, kind of small artsy venues like that, uh, and you know really enjoyed it. Decided to move back to Kansas for a variety of reasons. One of those things being, I want to reverse the trend of you know the brain drain that the Midwest has, where mm. a lot of the um, you know people that can get out do get out and leave and never come back. Um, but you're not from here. Is I that? am. No. Oh, you are. Yeah. Okay. I, I okay. grew up uh, just outside um, town with the southeast of Spain. Okay. Well, yeah. that that makes sense then. That makes the sense to the connection why you've come back. Now, yeah. are you are you professionally trained as a chef? Oh, are absolutely you self not. No, taught? I'm, I'm self-taught, yeah. I'm is, if I'm professionally trained in anything, it's in writing and literature. Is that right? Yeah. So did you go to college for writing and literature? I was a Russian literature major. Oh, yeah. my goodness. Do you speak Russian? A little bit. A little bit? That's yeah. interesting. Did you have, were you like then, to, to take off and do this, even at your young age, were you the guy with the lemonade stand growing up? or no. how, how did you become an entrepreneur? Because I, I, to me, there's a little bit of a spirit of entrepreneur in people who actually do what you're doing. Well, I, I think that um, it's part of a larger creative mission. I mean, I, I think that it's uh, the entrepreneurship is part of this larger creative gesture that right. I have. And right. uh, so I just love, I always love making things, love daydreaming mm -hmm. about things. And, uh, you know, who doesn't daydream about a restaurant, for instance? And, you know, especially where there 
isn't one like what you want. Mm -hmm. And so right. when, when we move back, you know, I, I'm really just kind of looking for places that I want to hang out in. And if no one else is going to make them, then maybe I'll give give it a shot. Um, but but as far as the, the money making thing, that's not the which is kind of the hallmark of the entrepreneurship. I mean, it can be. It's like one. Well, it's either thing. keeping you in business or not. Right. Keeping you in business. The fact is, of actually having to make a living so you can yes. live and, and do do your business. Too. I'm working on that. Okay, oh, working on that part. <laughs> well, it's interesting that you mentioned because because one of the things that came out loud and clear when you talked about being an entrepreneur is the creative aspect. And Webster's Dictionary actually pulls that into their definition. Creative, innovative, because I think what you're trying to do is also innovative. You know, certainly here in, in, in Salina, Kansas, you know, I would consider it innovative because you also, you know, you have a greater vision. Um, it also said here that you live in the future. Tell me kind of how your head works, you know, because I'm, I'm still, again, so entranced with entrepreneurs because you know I've started a company mm -hmm. myself yeah. and it's been very successful mm -hmm. for 19 years and this radio show is kind of my next venture, so... Uh, well, do you live in the future in your head? Do you visualize a lot? Uh, well, yes, absolutely. I mean, mm -hmm. living in the future, um, for sure. But also, I like to look as far back in the past as, as I can, too. Your whole um, many years you have on you? Well, not, not just my <laughs> past, but, uh, but also oh, just it's, the, it's the past of the state. You know, I mean, I think Kansas is a fascinating place, and I think that a lot of us pretend that you know, the past like 20 years is is all that has existed, you know, but the, the thing that I'm doing with this cafe is what every cafe was doing, uh, you know, 50, 60 years ago. That's interesting. Uh, and, you know, they were, the only product you had was local, and, mm -hmm. uh, you, mm -hmm. made, you know, and everybody's, you know, voice was different, and so, you know, you'd find different food wherever you go, and everybody's recipes would be different, and now, you know, the vast majority of money that's spent and of food that's consumed in this town goes to a chain. Right, uh, it's it's all standardized. It's all standardized. Where yeah. where what you're offering is very unique to you yeah. and your skills and the local yeah. produce and yeah, and also supports the local economy in a way that those don't. I mean, right. the, the chains all they provide are low uh, paying jobs, you know, to people that work there. That's the only money that stays in the community. Uh, all the rest of it goes elsewhere. Whereas, goes into the big corporations. Yeah. Whereas we put um, just in the eight months that we've been open, uh, I estimate over thirty thousand dollars into the pockets of local farmers. And I, you know, that's kind of the thing that keeps keeps me going, and that's why I like to think that in the past, where those things matter, where those those communities matter, and that's when we buy from our neighbors, and that creates better relationships, you know, and and all of those things that used to happen because they had to, are going to happen in the future, in part maybe because they'll have to again, but exactly. also because we're figuring out, you know, that it's actually more rewarding, more enjoyable, more pleasurable for that. Happen. Well, and my husband has this thing about everything's all about cheap fuel, and when the fuel prices go up, they're going to have to all revert to what we did 50 years ago or what you're doing today. But as you talk about this, William, I just sense this great passion, you know, surging in you. You know, I can hear it in your voice. I can see it in your body language, too, that, you know, you're obviously passionate about the, the uh, process you've created here of, you know, just your vision for this business. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. And, and I'll tell you where it comes from, too. Yes. Uh, it comes from growing up out mm -hmm. in rural Kansas mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and the loneliness of it. You know, we were surrounded by fields growing food. None of that food went to me. None of that food went to anybody that I knew. You know, I mean, occasionally you, you get some sweet corn or something, but the vast majority of the energy out there was, was desolate. You know, it was all done by machines. Um, right. That, you know, and people ran them, but it was just one person spinning by once a month or something. Uh, and, you know, out there you're kind of stuck, you know, and you don't have, uh, there wasn't a lot of, like, local culture for uh, independent culture that I was aware of generally, and I also wasn't taught the history of my state, you know, so I didn't know why all these ha things happened. and um, Why we're transporting it all or exporting right, it all right. out of our state um, instead of using more here. Right. And, it's and all big business, big farming. Where, did yeah. you grow up on a farm then, like a family farm? Or uh, yeah, the, we, there was, more rural? yeah, it was it was a rural area, mm -hmm. um, and there was a little bit of farming. We leased out some land, but mainly uh, my mother's a collector of wayward animals, and so we just had all kinds of animals around because that's what she does. Right, right. So you didn't go into veterinary medicine or anything like that. You went no. into. Were you were you someone who liked to cook when you were a young person? I always did love to cook. Well, yeah. that's good. That's good. Yeah, my mom tells the story that uh, I was ten and uh, making some hamburger helper, and, <laughs> and I was raiding the spice rack yeah. to try to like make it better. And yeah, so that's. Well, that's part of that creative creativeness mm -hmm. as well. 
So, so what what is it like as far as your work ethic? Because I always think that people, when they want to start a business and they think it's so so glamorous to have your own business, your own company, be an entrepreneur, what are your work hours like? Tell us the reality of it. Well, when we first started, um, I was working uh, 18, 19 hours a day. Um, oh my gosh. Seven days a week. I mean, it was, because uh, we did this on a shoestring budget. So you like had a pillow and a sleeping bag in the Just closet about. or in the corner yeah. of the restaurant? Yeah. Well, I mean, I was there at uh, four in the morning mm -hmm. uh, grilling up, up all the meat and a, a grill that we had outdoors because we didn't have a a full kitchen and we just had like a sandwich press so I was doing all my meat outside on a propane grill in the morning before dawn and mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. opening up and cooking and then doing all the prep and uh, those hours lasted for a few months and then I was able to get some reliable people in and then it went down to like you know 10 12 hours a day and uh, and now you know you're constantly working but uh, and you know I, I still put in probably 60 hours a week like actual labor wow but even when that's not happening you're just constantly thinking about the absolutely business. You, don't, you don't go home absolutely like you, a day off is almost kind of frustrating um, because you don't you, you know that you're you know there's lines. things yeah. you have to do you know yeah. that you know if you don't work a little bit on it every day you're gonna have to go back and work doubly hard or put in right. another 18 hour day yeah and did you did you think that or realize any of that before you opened up or started this venture I knew it was going to be long hours. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize the extent to which everything could go wrong. Oh, I mean, no. I, oh, no. I, I theoretically knew. I mean, it's Murphy's Law, and that's, uh -huh. that's actually a family name, so it's present in my mm -hmm. mind that anything that can go wrong will, and anything that can't go wrong will. Mm -hmm. uh, but, um, but you know, we've, we've had plumbing issues, leaky roofs, uh, electrical issues, the city turning off our water due to construction, you know, I, just you name it, you know, suppliers not coming in with things, uh, is, uh, and of course staff issues, uh, I mean every, right. every single aspect of the business, every single component uh, will occasionally need work and sometimes will go disastrously off the rails, mm -hmm. uh, especially with something like a, a restaurant which has so many moving parts. Yes, uh, and, ours and so many expectations yeah. by the consumer, I mean, right. my gosh, you know, right. people are so discrim you know, discriminating these days. Well, discriminating, I, uh, picky, I think. Picky, yeah, yeah I, that's another, that was probably the better word. Yeah, and that's that's what kind of all these chains have done also, mm -hmm. is that they've, uh, everything is the same every single time, and that's because they don't use real ingredients. True. They have bags of frozen things that they cut open, and then they put into a fryer, um, mostly, right. uh, and then throw it onto your plate. And, and so I've heard those chains yeah. have maybe like 10 or 12 ingredients, and if you look at the menu, I mean, this is probably an exaggeration, but then if you look at the menu, you will see how they use those 10 or 12 ingredients and mix them around to mm -hmm. make different kinds of dishes. Have you, uh, you might notice well, that. Well, that's, that's. More than I. I. That's in part like, every restaurant has to do that a little bit. Yeah, that's true. Um, but that's what, true. what they have is actually, those ingredients, as you call them, are actually lists of ingredients that are like 30 or 40 things long. And it's got all of these uh, preservatives, stabilizers, dyes, um, a huge host of things that aren't really food that they put in there. Right. And they use those all around. And that's scary. Yeah, but it also yeah. saves them a lot of time. Whereas since I make everything by, from scratch, mm -hmm. one, you know, my food will actually go bad. You know, it can't just mm -hmm. like sit there forever. Mm -hmm. uh, it has to be done fresh or mm -hmm. else it, it goes. Mm -hmm. um, and also we have to actually know what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And that's a part of the thing of like getting, getting good people in there that you can trust to, to actually cook and not just, uh, you know, be a robot. Well, and I have to say, you know, my husband and I were there Saturday having lunch, and I just said about three times to him, I'm eating this salad. And see, I grew up on a farm, and we had the big garden, so I'm used to eating fresh produce right out of the garden, or at least I did when I was younger and had that. And that's what I kept saying. I said, gosh, this is just like it just goes picked. It's so fresh. It's the best salad. I think I said to him, this is the best salad I've had in five years. You know, <laughs> and he thought that was kind of a bit of an exaggeration, which it might have been, but still well, I enjoyed that. Way that. The time. Yeah, that it did. Yeah. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, take a little break here, but want everybody to stay and stay listening in with William coming back to talk some more about entrepreneurship. This is Joan with the Joan Yerkovich Show, 910 KINA. Stumbled over that a little bit. <laughs> I was thinking about that lettuce salad. I couldn't get it out of my head. It sounds tremendous. I'm a vegetarian, good. so oh, you I, are. Yeah, oh, when I ate God. at your place, I appreciated the range of options. Yeah, well, I hope you get more more time to come in more. I, know. I was telling him as a single mother, I 